When we think about our pitch for the very first time, where should our starting point be? Should it be our solution? Should it be us, the people that are pitching? The answer is it should be you, our audience. We should begin with knowing our audience, how they think, and then shaping our pitch accordingly. The thing is, it's quite tricky to climb inside the heads of our audience to understand how they think and feel. So I sought out expert advice and I got to interview an individual called Jonathan Marshall. He's a psychologist and a psychotherapist and an individual that knows a thing or two about how our brains work. He either taught or studied at Harvard and Stanford. He was an officer in the military and one of, one of the founders of a company that went on to be called Yahoo Mail. I'll begin my interview by asking Jonathan, how then do we begin understanding how people's minds work. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking this time to, to speak to me today. It's very, very kind of you. And I see from the background there that you are a sporty man. Uh, I see a bike. Is that a mountain bike? It's a mountain bike. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say there are two. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> Yes, now, those are my sources of injuries or among them. One of the questions I have for you is around empathy, because particularly for people like myself, one of the things I realised is that I, not everyone thinks like me. And the sooner I realised that, I, I should have realised that actually early on in my life, and I probably would have been much better off. But I was talking to an individual who was starting a fintech company, and he had a very quantitative background. And he said, actually, it's the salespeople who know the customers the most. That's why they're very often the most successful people. I think he'd just seen the film, The Founder, about the found starting of McDonald's. So these people have experience of others, so they're able to, to, uh, to interpret the needs and wants of other people. And in one of your blogs, you talk about speaking to Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, and you asked him about the threats to mankind. This is getting pretty big now, but we'll come back to the point. And he said to you, the thing which we need to build to stop mankind being threatened is empathy. So, which I thought was very interesting and profound, and, and I agree. How then do you build that sense of, sense of empathy? Say you're taking someone who's in their early 20s, never, or in, at any age, but never really had that front-facing role. How do they quickly get to know their audience and resonate with them, build trust and build up that sense of empathy. How would you suggest people do that? If you can't feel your emotions, it's very hard to feel somebody else's emotions. And so um, what I'll often work on is, sounds really rudimentary and perhaps not useful, is what's going on right now? So let's say we were working together. I'd say, what are you feeling right now? And you're like, nothing. I'm like, well, can you feel the pressure of your seat against the chair and you're like yeah but so get really even even to the the very um concrete and then getting more and more subtle where people may become more familiar with their emotions often you'll find where people have a real lack of empathy is they may be carrying trauma and there's something internal that has meant that i don't want to feel my emotions you know something bad happened or there are bad motions locked up in there. I don't want to go there. And so by helping them work through whatever resistance there may be, whatever bruising it could be, uh, you know, neglectful parents, uh, a traumatic experience. And it's sometimes stuff which as a child we might feel was terribly painful, but as an adult, we look back and go, come on, that's not a big deal. Like how could, how could that be so such cause such an effect? But, Nevertheless, we've stored it, we've encoded it in our minds as, as things that wall us off from ourselves. And so the first thing is often becoming more sensitive to oneself. I'll then sometimes work with them to become sensitive to me. And so I'll describe what I'm feeling and they might go, oh really, you feel that? Uh, and then sometimes I'll ask them, what do, you, what do you think I'm feeling? So we're practicing, they're practicing, you know, vivo. Um, Sometimes I'll, I'll do 360s uh, with people. So I'll interview their, their peers, their superiors, their subordinates, their direct reports, um, and, and show them the report and say, you know, did you know that people felt this way about you? Is any of this a surprise? What can you do to 
you know, you think you're a draconian manager, but here are five of your direct reports all describing you as a softie. Um, how did, you know, and so really trying to get very, very specific. So I don't use um, any kind of big theory or overarching formula. It's getting very concrete and very specific as soon as possible. So you begin with uh, getting in touch with one's own feelings, to think about one's own feelings and recognizing those, and then moving across to rapidly, for example, I think you're thinking X and actual fact you're thinking Y, and I start to recognize and attune myself that my perception of other people is not perhaps accurate. Okay, good, good. And, and modeling is a part of that. So for example, and I think especially this is where being a guy can be an advantage because I think a lot of men, um, you know, kind of, kind of allowed maybe three emotions, anger, lust, maybe one other, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're very, uh, you know, in terms of, Monetary and social power, we're definitely, you know, we have advantages. But when it comes to emotional expression and, and, and uh, experience, we are definitely way behind women. Um, and, and so in showing that I'm able to describe what I'm feeling, including feelings of vulnerability, oh, well, actually, I feel a bit intimidated right now. And the client might go, what, you're intimidated? You're the doctor, you're the one I'm paying. Uh, and like, yeah, the way you say that makes me feel kind of inadequate or am I going to do a good job? And they may kind of go, I knew you were, you know, I knew you were softy. Uh, and I get that sometimes, but more often I have them go, hmm, okay, maybe I'm also allowed to feel vulnerable or weak, at least with this guy. Um, and that can help unpack some of the, the blockages that a person has. Right, okay. You should, exposing your own vulnerabilities helps the other person feel like you're more human and that they can reveal their own. Yeah. Okay. And on that point of vulnerabilities, whenever I ask a big group of people uh, uh, a question, I'm re I recognise that because of those other people around them, I'm not going to necessarily get an honest answer. Say I've got 100 people in the room and I ask a question of them, only a few people typically will... will raise their hands and, this, and, and proclaim any issue. When I ask about fears, um, and particularly in the world of pitching and uh, trying to persuade other people, it's, it's kind of like, it's a form of public speaking. When I speak to people about their fear of public speaking, multiple people have different reasons about why they might fear it. For me, it was just a matter of building a skill so that you can become good at pitching. But for some people, when I speak to them, particularly after the event, they'll approach me and they'll speak to me one-on-one -on -one and they'll say, Andrew, actually, a lot changes for me and I have real issues and it's holding me back in my job or it's holding me back in whatever. Those people seem to have a more deep-rooted challenge with public speaking. Do you ever come across people that have that kind of fear? And if so, what do you say to them? Is, is, what, what are the kind of things that they can do? Um, I've, I've worked, the fear of public speaking, by the way, is rated as more, uh, evokes more anxiety than death. In surveys of, of, of things that cause anxiety, public speaking is, is right up there. Um, and I, for me, it, it very much depends. I tailor the work I do to the specific individual. So for example, uh, one client I had a long time ago, suddenly out of the blue, developed an extremely debilitating fear of public speaking. Um, he was uh, suddenly terrified of it, having not had a problem for all his career. And, and there he was in his, I guess, late 20s, early 30s, uh, having done a lot of public speaking. Um, and it was absolutely debilitating, causing him difficulty to hold his bladder. Uh, like, it was, it was really bad news for him. Um, and I, a part of what I do is I work a lot with trance states. Uh, and we used uh, some hypnosis. And what became quite quickly apparent was that this new experience had been triggered um, by an event that happened a long time be before in a hostile union negotiation where he was in a room alone with uh, multiple very aggressive union representatives that regarded him as the ambassador of the evil corporate world. And so he was facing a lot of um, 
aggression. He uh, was afraid for his physical well-being. And somehow that just got trapped inside him. He, he went on like a machine. He continued to, to work on for a couple of years. And then suddenly, kaboom, this anxiety exploded. Um, and that's not as uncommon as it seems. Sometimes when people get the opportunity to relax into what's really going on inside, these bubbles of anxiety or pain can come to the surface. And um, actually, it was one of my, my first uh, experiences treating uh, public speaking through hypnosis. And uh, we had about five sessions together, and then it was the end. I, I think I was relocating, so we couldn't continue our work. Um, and I got an email from him about two months later. And he said, I just want to let you know I am 83% recovered. And I was like, how do you do that? How do you know 83 and not 85%? You know, but, but there he was. He was a very um, you know, management consultant type. He could, he could turn anything into a number. And he believed it was uh, because of getting the insight about what had caused the anxiety. And I also, um, we'd use a programming technique where he had a favorite coin. And so we kind of created the favorite coin as a magic coin that he could hold. I think it was, he could hold, see the magic coin and squeeze it for three seconds while saying a particular phrase to himself. I forget what the phrase was. And that when he let it go, the magic in the coin would fill his body and he would feel more calm, more content, and able to speak fluently. And he practiced this a lot, and he and his magic coin became inseparable. Um, there's a downside to that, which is what happens if he loses the magic coin, but at least he knows that he has that, that ability. But um, there are systematic protocols for how you handle uh, phobias, you know, public speaking phobia. Um, this would be a little bit more unusual, but it was tailored and specific, and heck, 83% in five sessions? That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Okay, so if someone did have a fear of public speaking, and they, it's because of a sense of anxiety rather than a skill. They should, they should, you would recommend they speak to a, who should they go, I mean, they'll say to me, literally, after the, after the event, they'll say to me, who should I go and speak to? What would you, what, what would you recommend? Um, I think there are two, like, for, phobia is one of the areas where psychologists are good at treating them. Like, there are lots of things psychologists are not very good at. We might be better than anybody else, but we're just simply not that good at it. Phobias, we're good at. Um, so the standard protocol for public speaking phobia is let's practice one-on-one, -on -one, now let's practice with a few more people, maybe a safe group of people, and then finally a big audience. So it's, it's uh, incremental, it's behaviorism. Um, so for most people with public speaking, you know, just off the back of the envelope, I'd say see a psycho psychologist who specializes in this sort of thing. Or if you don't want to go through that expense, go to, go to something like Toastmasters, which is a group, uh, I think they have that in the UK as well, I'm not sure, where people practice giving speeches and um, I know some people who think, oh, Toastmasters is, is for Wally's, you know, people who can't public speak. I can public speak. I just want to get even better at it. Actually, I've heard some amazing speakers who were trained through Postmasters, Toastmasters. So those are the two paths I would take. Either a psychotherapist who does this sort of work or just go straight to a place like Toastmasters. Okay. Uh, it, it, Toastmasters is what I recommend. It's where I, where I learned my skills. So I would often recommend Toastmasters, but I'm mindful that's, that's, that can work for some and not all. So it's useful to know to go and see some specialists in third public speaking. Okay, and to switch slightly now, uh, from some of your work, I know we haven't got, haven't got much longer, but I wanted to ask you a, a couple more questions. You speak about something called persuasive computing. Or persuasive, yes, persuasive computing. What is it? Um, Question. Sure, I don't do a ton of it now, but I was very interested in the mind-body connection and um, a great a lecturer at Stanford was very interested in uh, the, the human computer connection. And so this became the mind body computer thing. Um, and we did some of the first and biggest research, for example, on what makes websites credible. Uh, how do you influence people through websites? Does it matter if you have a bogus badge saying, you know, the, you know, award-winning top five websites 
according to, and you put some random name there, does it make a big difference? If you have really cool gizmos on your website, uh, does that make a difference? And it turned out at the time that for Northern Europeans, especially Finns and Norwegians and you know, very North, Northern European, they loved the gizmos. They loved the, the features. That made, created in them a sense of a website being credible. Whereas say to the North Americans, uh, the badges uh, was what created credibility for them. Um, having simple things like an address, if you had in the contacts page, the address of your organization, that gave particularly uh, Anglo populations a sense of relief, like, ah, that's, uh, we know this isn't some 17 year old in the Bahamas who's published this website. It's published by some group we can sue in London. Um, so there were these, these funny little things that made a big difference. Right, and that, that's, that's grown into quite a big field now, hasn't it? That whole, I mean, website design. Huge, uh, and, and how do you create trust on a website is now, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. And when was it you did that? Uh, that was in, that was like 15 years ago. Okay, yeah. I think I read 2002, I think, from memory when I looked at the article. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. And I sorry. only took 10% of my time doing that. The 90% of my research was in a totally different area that nobody oh. was interested in or heard of. Whereas that 10% really, that did quite well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final two questions for you. I have five more minutes. Uh, leadership, you focus on leaders. Yeah. And what do you say to people that are in a leadership position? How, how do you explain persuasion to those people about how do they get their employees or stakeholders or perhaps people above them, whomever? How do you explain to them the basics of getting other people to do things for them? You've already touched on it with Kofi Annan's point, is empathy. Um, that by being able to empathize with the situation that say my subordinates, my reports, whatever are in, I have a better sense of what to do, which doesn't mean being very empathic in my style. I may have to fire people. I may have to give people bad news. But if I can put myself in their situation, I can have a better sense of what would be useful. Um, I'm trying to give some good examples of it. Having said that, there are, I think there are hard and fast rules. There are some which, you, you know, for example, uh, some of my former students um, are in military positions or are in government positions where they've had to handle very ugly environments. So, you know, one is you never fire live rounds on your own population. Like that is never gonna be a satisfactory uh, thing to do. Like that there are certain forms of persuasion that are just simply not okay. <laughs> that will, you know, and never mind being Machiavelli, like if you just take a purely Machiavelli perspective, that will come back to bite you. Um, you know, tear gas, uh, rubber bullets, like maybe, but uh, live rounds, I, I, I cannot think of an occasion. I think of you know, what happened to Deng, Deng Xiaoping when he fired live rounds on, on Tiananmen Square, I think. Um, but, but generally speaking, I think by yeah, connecting with that environment, how would I respond well? You know, what would I want if I was your subordinate in this situation? Um, how would I want to be spoken to? I think, is it, when Kofi Annan said to me that the solution lies in empathy, I, I told him I was just incredibly disappointed. I thought, <laughs> is that the best you've got? Really, like empathy, we're not, empathy is just so not a strong thing in so many people and we have to rely on that. And uh, he said, that's, that's the best we've got. And now, having reflected on it a lot, and at first with some sense of dismay, I think he's right. I think that's what we've got. And uh, cultivating that's going to be very important for all of us. So you have said, I think I've read about you, that you, you've managed 100 people in the Navy. And one of the things that people often say to me, that of course, if you're in the army or the military, you want people to do things, you say to them, do it, or, I'll kill you, or something, you know, there's that kind of command structure, which is kind of, people believe that force is employed, but from my experience, that's not how big people get things done in the military. How do you, or how did you get things done with the people that were, you were in command of in the military? I think only civilians believe that you have this 
remarkable control. I mean, some of it is true. You can lock someone up for disobeying an order, but the penalties you're going to get are so enormous that it's never going to be worth, you know, it's rarely going to be worth being uh, so intimidating. So um, I think, for example, when working with my peers in, for example, midshipman school or as an officer, you had to use relationship, you had to use warmth. Occasionally, maybe you had to be a bit intimidating and fierce. Um, and with, I remember I'd been, in my last six months, I was put to a base which occasionally was joked as being called Hawaii camp because there were a couple of top brass and there were a lot of, uh, of, of men of, of the lower ranks. Um, and myself and a colleague were put in as the in, the in between lot. And so it was an interesting place where there was a real discipline problem. And my colleague came in very fierce, giving people punishment, threatening people with uh, putting them behind bars. Um, I found myself, I was really was finding myself doing it. It wasn't deliberate. I took about two weeks just being a wallflower, which meant my credibility tanked. There I was 20 years old in charge of men uh, up to about almost the age of 40 or 42, I think was the oldest. But most of them were around the age of 20 uh, in an environment where everybody was sussing me out. Who was this guy? Was the other fellow really going to be, you know, so much harder to, to deal with than me? And then finding after two weeks when I learned the ropes um, and I watched one of the, the senior non-commissioned officers try and bullshit me on something, um, I, I ripped him to shreds and I ripped him to shreds in the somewhat private environment of the senior uh, NCOs and the other officer. And it, it was a certain amount of kind of looking at myself doing it and learning the wisdom. And, and I think what I was doing is I was learning what was necessary. And when I was sure of what I was doing, I was then being very firm. And I did something similar to the, what we called the other ranks. Um, about a two days later. And it was as if I was, once I understood what was going on, I realized there was an urgent problem. Charm and warmth and agreeability was going to take way too long and that no one was going to respect me. In fact, I probably lost a lot of the respect that I naturally came in with. And that by being uh, fierce and intimidating, just once or twice was enough to completely change the standard, which meant my next few months became a lot easier. So that period of observation that you described, where you didn't do anything for one or two weeks, you just observed and assessed, that must be quite difficult to do that, mustn't it, to sit, stand on the sidelines and not intervene? Because you, as you say, you, you can see and feel your, your, the respect people have you ever way. Yeah, it was a difficult situation because I was, I was completely foreign to this environment. I was trained to navigate warships. All of a sudden, I was in charge of, of, of three platoons of amphibious, of amphibious trained men uh, in an environment that was very different for me. So it was hard to, to feel that I could engage in a reasonable way. And the discipline problems were so severe. It was kind of like, well, where do you tackle them? Um, so it was tough. I certainly hope I'm not in that situation again, because in two weeks, you can lose an awful lot of the respect you might otherwise have. But I think it, what was helpful to me was just that by the time I made a stand, um, I didn't have to rely on, I knew who to trust and I knew, had a sense of what was going on. There's a mix there between exercising the power of the office as well as exercising your relationship power to get what you want. Yes. And one-on-one, -on -one, I think, um, it always had to rely heavily on relationship power, on, on, on connection. So if in front of a group of people, um, uh, uh, shame was the fastest way in the Singapore culture, it seemed to me, to create order. Um, and so you'd see officers who would target one person, shame them like crazy in front of 160, and then you have compliance. But you've now really hurt one person. And... Um, so that process of titrating how much brutality can you exhibit in a public arena where you need, as 
say, an 18, 19 year old in charge of people older than you and many of them, how much of that do you really need to do? And how do you repair in the one-on-one -on -one interactions afterwards to make everybody go, okay, that's just part of what we do. Because that goes back to that kind of sense of to be feel, to be loved, right? Yeah, the Machiavelli yeah. example. Um, and people will do what you say, but they won't necessarily volunteer up information which could be of value to you because they don't love you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it's a about, the an answer there is um, that if there are times, people understand, or at least in that environment, it seems to me they understood why people were fierce. There were people who were jerks when they were fierce and they were assholes, they were egotistical and they you know, did it for their own pride. And then there were people who I found myself respecting because you know, that officer needed to do that. There was a real problem. You needed to get in line. And at some level, maybe even appreciating the discipline that was restored because we all, there's a certain anarchy that nobody wants. Um, and so I think by being able to do the dance of, in some arenas, I am predictably uh, hard-assed. And in another arena, I'm warm. And you guys know when to expect what that you've even hopefully got the dance of the best of both worlds. Yeah, makes complete sense. So as long as it's justifiable and um, people respect you for that. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And now you're in academia. Uh, how, how do you then apply yourself in that world? How do you persuade other people to do things in that world? What's the difference between that and the military? I'd imagine considerable. Massive. Couldn't be more. Uh, now, I'm only sort of one day a week in academia. I used to be full time. But um, yeah, where uh, in the armed forces, you could write an email that was say five words long and none of the please and the thank yous and the dears and the sincerely's. Um, and going, that's just simply not gonna fly. You're gonna hurt people's feelings. And there's no, you know, they might turn away from the job. They might, you know, like it, it's, whereas in the armed forces, there's a sense of this person's in a contract, they're not going to leave for the next five years. If I've hurt their feelings, we'll work it out. But they'll, we'll get to know each other. But uh, no, as an academic, realizing um, it's, it's very different. Time frames are very different. In the military, everything is hurry up and wait. In academia, it's, uh, you, 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 yeah, the, the time frames are massive. You do all your research. You send your article off for publication. Six months later, you hear back your first response. Um, so learning that... But there is a similarity in that people judge you for the quality of your work. They see through the charm quite quickly to, uh, is this guy serious? Is this guy a serious thinker or not? Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and then, so you mentioned that one day a week you are now in, in, in academia. So the other four days a week, I'm assuming here you do coaching and you help people in leadership positions, is that right? That's right, that's right. Leadership training. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then with leadership training, how do you, this is a question that I always ask people that I interview, how do you attract people in the first place? And then how do you get to them, particularly in your world, how do you get people to work on themselves? That can be tricky. Um, leverage is very, very important. And if I don't do that well, it probably won't go far. I think of um, one of my first international coaching engagements where um, I was asked by a colleague to, to work with a multinational based in the Philippines. And um, there were two executives I was working with there. One had just been promoted to general manager. Uh, and he was suddenly, as they put it, misbehaving. He was throwing files at the top team he would get on his knees and implore people to do things. Uh, he was very extravagant in his emotional outbursts. And most of the top team within that first four months had resigned. And so the head of HR said to me very straightforwardly, he, has, he said, you have only one job. Within six months, the general manager will be fired. I just want from you a less painful six months. That's all your job is. And I was like, well, that's not a very, you know, that's not a high tall order. Um, so I met the guy after having done a lot of research. I interviewed the CEO, the CFO, the head of HR. I interviewed a lot of people before I met him. Um, and he was very arrogant. He was talking about how great he was, how annoying it was that he had to come to this meeting. 
on the head of HR was full of shit. Um, and, uh, you know, I was getting a lot of kind of blowback of, okay, white guy, what the fuck are you doing here? Forgive my language, that's okay. Um, uh, you know, you're taking my time. I'm general manager of this major, of this major outfit. And um, I thought it's time to spill the beans. I said, do you know why I'm here? And he goes, yeah, to make me even better. Thank you very much. And I said, no, I'm here because you're already fired. However, your, your H, head of HR wants a less painful six months. And my guess is if you and I work well together, we can get you more. Um, and so it was a very strong strike, a very big blow um, to his ego. And I think he could tell I was being straightforward. And when he realized I'd spoken to every senior person in the company, including the owners, uh, that I knew an awful lot about him that he didn't realize, then he was like, oh, it's probably time to pay, play ball. As a junior, uh, as, as fairly young person in the profession, I discovered kind of by accident a similar formula. So I was working for one of the top business schools in the world, and I was there as a psychotherapist, but I was getting these high-performing people coming in who were not looking for the treatment of psychopathology. They were, they were looking for peak performance, but they valued their time, this was in the, in the 90s, or the early 2000s, uh, at about, I kind of calculated, it was about eight, 900 US dollars an hour is how much they valued their time. So seeing me, which was one hour, and half an hour on each side for transport, they're like, am I getting $1,600 worth of benefit from this goofy postdoc? Um, and I found with the men that I needed to intimidate them or strike them in a way that made them afraid in about the first 40 minutes. I had to say something that was shocking for them to suddenly kind of go, oh, maybe I can respect this guy. Now you I got- So feel me, but you had to, to use the expression, you had to violate expectations? I think that's actually what I was doing. But I violate expectations in a way that made people go on the back foot. Um, so it wasn't a positive expectation that I was, you know, but it made people feel like, oh, God, how did he see that so quickly? Um, and, and from there I could move forward. Now, maybe it's the environment, maybe because I'm older, I, I don't have to do that. I can be much more gentle. Um, but it was a similar thing of striking hard with credibility very, very quickly and then having people go, okay, now I'm listening to you. What do you have to say? So your advice to others, how, how then would you apply that? Because lots of other people might come to me and say, I, I focus on pitching, but lots of other people want to talk to me about uh, persuasion in a broader context. And say they've got difficult people in the workplace, etc. that they want to influence and persuade. Um, depending on where you are in your life and depending on your position, you would adjust accordingly. But it sounds to me like you suddenly were able to say to your, to your clients, they, they felt like you had their number, but like you got them really quickly. And oh, okay, a bit like your mother might have your number, yet she <laughs> knows you. So what advice then, how would you transpose that into the workplace for people who are, who are trying to manage difficult people? Oh, I wouldn't use that in the workplace that way. It's way too aggressive. The deal with me is, let's say I'm working on a 50 or 60 minute hour. Um, I know at the end of that hour, everybody's thinking, do I want to see that guy again? And the, the, it, it, it's going against me. Nobody, you know, there isn't that much incentive. It may be expensive. It's time consuming. If you're an important person with a big influential job, it's just an awful lot of effort. Um, and so I have in that small window of time, got to get to know someone. And if, what I'm getting in response, and I, really it was only the men who would give it to me, especially when I was younger, this sense of contempt, like I'm only here because my boss tells me I have to be. Um, I had to, yeah, violate expectations in a way that made them feel like that I may have something more than they realized. Uh, but in, if let's say it's your subordinates at work, you do something like that, uh, it's too much. People will, will hate you for being such a smart ass, they'll hate you for being so, to the fact that you can see through them faster than they, they'd hoped for. Um, yeah, does that make sense? It makes complete sense. Uh, to, 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 to end then, uh, 
my, my last question for you is what on earth is being a certified laughter yoga teacher? <laughs> um, I just took a weekend course in laughter yoga and I put things on my website, but I gotta say, it was brilliant fun. I, I, I have a very good friend who has done every kind of psychological and spiritual course. And uh, she was an army major UK, for the UK army. And she's interested in Christianity and Buddhist mindfulness. And she's done a whole lot. And I said to her one day, I'm like, what has helped you most? And she said, laughter yoga. And I'm like, really? So I signed up for a weekend. And really, all I can remember doing is trying to find dumb ways, some excuses to laugh more. And I felt great. I was like, laughter truly is a brilliant medicine. I mean, you know, if all the leaders of the world, like, you know, to, to, to do their next year of leadership had to laugh for half an hour to pass an exam, where you just, you know, required all of them to laugh for half an hour every morning before they could go to work, the world would be a much better place. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. I strongly recommend trying it. In fact, I, I, I do this dumb game with some of my classes um, where if things have been a bit heavy, and I can be a bit intense as an instructor, uh, we'll do sort of psychological simulations, and some of those simulations are really pretty hard. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a break, we'll come back from the break, and I have to change the energy. I'll just say, look, next door is my colleague so-and-so. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll find out who it was. I'll say, I really like making him feel jealous because I want him to think I'm a better instructor than he is. So at the count of three, please, everybody laugh really loudly. And as they laugh, I open the door, which they all find funny because I'm actually trying to make the sound of laughter carry over to the room next door. And, um, and so then the laughter becomes a natural laughter from being a fake laughter. And then a few moments, like, all of a sudden, nobody needs the excuse. They're just laughing. And uh, it's a I'm lovely... going to use that. I'm yeah. going to that sounds really good. When you combine it with like that jealousy thing, people find it kind of amusing. <laughs> That's terrific. Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Andrew. Really uh, Thanks very much. Have a good day.